So yeah, there's two okay, things. We're back. We're yeah. live. We're here on Energy in America, our show on uh, Wednesdays at three three o'clock. Rock with Lou Pudirisi, and he is the CEO, President and CEO of EPRINC, which is an energy think tank in Washington, D.C., and that, and that puts him very close to Congress. It puts him close to the White House. He can hear, see, smell, and otherwise sense all the stuff that's going on in Washington. We love to talk to him about what he sees and smells and hears about things in Washington these days because it's fairly unreliable or unpredictable, I should say. So we're calling this show How Energy Decision Process Has Changed Over the Past 18 Days or So. Welcome back to the show, Lou. Nice to have you here. Good to be here. Good to be here, Jim. So let's talk about, uh, let's see, what do we talk about first? Let's talk about integrated uh, energy, pro uh, energy market um, phenomenon. Let's talk about Mexico, which we have a little, we had a little rocky road with them. And let's talk about Canada, which we also have a rocky road with. How, how, how um, is the energy market affected by our recent... Um, uh, well, let, let's just start with a, uh, you know, you, the North America is over 9 million square miles. Mm -hmm. So it is a huge land mass. And it lends itself to all kinds of transportation efficiencies and solutions. So you may see big numbers in gross imports and exports, say, of crude oil and petroleum products and natural gas. But the net numbers are quite different just because everyone's trying to solve these transportation efficiencies. So North America, U.S., Canada, and Mexico consume 22 million barrels a day of crude oil. Wow. About a quarter of the world's total consumption. Mm -hmm. But out of that 22 million, if you treated NAFTA, the, you know, these three countries, as a single country, as a single market, net imports are only 4 million barrels a day. Mm. Not only that, uh, because Mexico has undergone a massive privatization and energy reform program, the U.S. exports of natural gas to Mexico are rising. They're about 4 billion cubic feet a day and expected to rise to 8 billion cubic feet a day in the next four to five years. The pipeline market in Mexico now is highly privatized. And most of that gas is replacing oil-fired uh, power generation stations like you have in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. so, so in a way, this North American production platform, in addition, Canadian oil sands are expected to increase by about a million barrels a day over the next 10 to 15 years. Finally, you know, the U.S. production profile, uh, Trump's uh, strategy to uh, release more production to uh, private sector development, uh, accelerated permitting of pipelines, more certainty in the permitting process, is likely to see U.S. production grow as well. And most analysts think that under a reasonable scenario, within the end of the decade, U.S., Canada, and Mexico combined will, have, will be a net exporter of crude oil. So the point I'm trying to make here as the administration enters into trade negotiations with both Canada and Mexico, largely over concerned of manufacturing disparities, let's say, or on what they believe is unfair trade in manufacturing, they have to consider the, this energy sector, which is highly, sex, highly successful, and by the way, largely outside NAFTA. Many people don't realize when NAFTA was created, the Mexican energy sector was wholly owned by the Mexican government mm. and so was not part of the NAFTA negotiations. Mm. Okay, so what, what effect then uh, will the changes in American energy policy have on this um, integrated market in North America? So on the one hand, we could have a very technical discussion in which uh, modest changes are made to the structure of how manufacturing entities are, you know, are negotiated what the tariff structure look like or how, what adjustments we make on non-tariff barriers or labor, whatever that is. And we do this without 
sort of damaging Mexican pride or creating a populist uprising in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And that outcome is fairly benign, could be quite positive. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if this is done in a way, I believe, in which the Mexicans feel they are disrespected, let's say, or that they are really treated poorly, uh, it could feed uh, populist resentment in Mexico, which could up and all the reform program that has taken place there over the last few years. And that's energy uh, reform you're talking about. Here, here this week, there were demonstrations, not against Trump, high gasoline prices. Mm -hmm. Managing that problem is a big, big deal. Yeah. So what we, what we have then is the risk that, uh, I mean, it's hard to say from what you yeah. say, uh, whether it'll go in one way or another direction. Um, but it could go into uh, uprisings and a rolling back, effectively, of the energy reforms that have taken place over the past year. Where, where does that leave us if we have an uprising and rolling back of the uh, energy reforms in Mexico? So I think that would leave the world oil market worse off because the potential to halt, halt the decline in oil production in Mexico would be uh, harmed. They're, they're ready to climb. One of the reasons they're privatizing uh, in Mexico and bringing in foreign investment is to halt the decline in oil production. It would harm the efficiency of the production platform in North America and probably would reduce world supplies because North America would not be as efficient, mm -hmm. which would mean higher prices. Mm -hmm. So, and also there's an energy security component because if North America is a prosperous energy producing platform. Things like sea lanes of communications, the things the Navy have to worry about are much smaller, right? Because the Western Hemisphere is not so connected to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say the Middle East isn't important. The Pacific Rim is very important. All these things are very important, but from just the physical, the management of the physical flows become a lot easier. Yeah. So. Uh yeah, you mentioned, though, that on balance, your thought was, your expectation was that energy prices, oil prices, would go up over the near term or maybe the intermediate term. So I guess you're making some judgments there on how things will go in Mexico and well, how I, things will go between the Trump administration and Mexico. I'm basically an optimist, and I believe they'll figure this out, that uh, cooler heads will prevail and that uh, that Trump is largely, it's not really ideological person in my view, he's a really transactional guy. Mm -hmm. uh, that the, we have the Abe visit coming up in which he's likely to have a very ambitious engagement with the U.S. And uh, two other, two or three other things that I think people have not realized yet. In terms of U.S. energy security and the importance of Mexico-Canadian relationship, General Mattis, General Kelly and Rex Tillerson, the, you know, the, in the, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Homeland Security, and the Secretary of State mm -hmm. are very well briefed on this topic and are likely to play a central role in managing it to a productive outcome. Mm -hmm. So if that happens, um, then you, you would expect better energy policy than maybe other, other people might predict, and therefore... Well, I mean, that's what people mean by better energy policy. If you are a climate enthusiast, you don't like to see any develop... You want to keep it all in the ground. Yeah. If you're uh, the U.S., as they say, a nationalist or, a, you know, maybe a Steve Bannon type, you want to see the U.S. and Mexico and Canada be, be big producers of fossil fuels, particularly oil. And, and that's the question, isn't it? Whether, you're, whether you uh, keep it in the ground or don't. Um, yeah. And so I'd mean, like to explore with you that if, if the price of um, oil goes up or down, it has an effect on the production of renewables and the incentives to renewable developers around the country. Uh, right now, renewables are um, competitive, aren't they? And as a result, renewable development is, is happening at an acceptable rate. But that is that going to change? So What's it, the it, factor it, there? So we've talked a lot about this in the past. If you're California and you can reach your grid network farther and farther afield and grab dispatchable power in Nevada or Arizona, you can probably push the envelope on renewables and let's say the power sector. 
But in Hawaii, you can't really find, if you decide to go without dispatchable power, you're gonna run out of the string very quickly. Mm -hmm. So Hawaii is going to need, Hawaii can't go to California or to Idaho and say, well, you know, we've got a great renewable program and in the dead part of the day when our renewables aren't working, we'll just turn the switch on in Idaho. Well, that doesn't work very well in Hawaii. So I think you have a unique issue, which we've talked a lot about. Mm -hmm. And I do think, I, I do think, as I said before, that we really need to continue research on batteries. Batteries is the key to this renewable debate. And if we can get the battery costs down, if we can get them efficient. And so renewables are cost competitive when the sun's shining. Renewables are cost competitive when the wind's blowing. It's when those things are not happening that they're not so good. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, where, I'm, where I get curious is, so we, we have a, an administration that is uh, clearly committed to ignoring climate change. Uh, and an administration which would like to see, you know, the traditional oil and, and coal fuels, um, you know, uh, dominate the market, dominate energy production in, in the, the United States. And what effect does that have over the long term on renewable production that was, you know, that was in place before this election? Because uh, there, was, there was a certain amount of it. There was, um, Obama was trying to incentivize it. Uh, there were companies coming up. Some of them did well. Some of them did not do well. After all, this is a transformation in energy in many places, just as it has been in Hawaii. It's, it's, it, you know, it's, uh, it's not without its challenges. Um, so if you have now this, this policy of uh, favoring uh, fossil fuel and favoring coal, uh, what does that do to an otherwise, what has been an otherwise <laughs> improving market, improving development environment um, for renewables. So, as we spoke before, uh, let's take the power sector. In the power sector, the I would imagine the clean power plan, the CPP, is uh, defunct. It's not going to happen. But all the research showed that the clean power plan would have no effect on climate. It was basically a demonstration effect to tell the rest of the world, look, we can do this. And so this is our leadership contribution. But its net effect on climate was immeasurable. Right? It was too small to measure. Mm. So I think, and then the second part of this debate here is you can get a lot of people to agree that CO2 loadings are increasing. You cannot get people in the new administration to agree that they have a workable model that tells them what the implications of those CO2 loadings are on the human environment. Now, but even Governor Perry at his hearing said, well, I think there's some uncertainty, but I think man is contributing. And I also think there's part of it which is not caused by man. And there is going to be a big fight over the the working of these models and everything. And my view is that should be largely a sideshow. If in fact renewables are cost effective in the power sector, right? Then, and the real problem is we don't, we don't have a solution for the intermittency. We should spend research on the intermittency. Ah, research. And I was gonna ask you about research. You know, here in Hawaii, we have a lot of research projects having to deal with the environment. We have really hundreds of them. Uh, that await funding from one source or another. Um, and a lot of researchers are very concerned that federal funding is going to dry up on those areas of research, which are important at University of Hawaii and which have, you know, University of Hawaii has an enormous number, a really creditable number of um, quality, top quality researchers in that area. And of course, they need they need funding. Uh, I, and, I, and I suspect that it will come true soon enough that they don't get funding. Well, part of that research is energy funding. Uh, I mean, it's energy research and therefore requires energy funding. And I, I would imagine that the uh, federal government, who you know is not in the same place as it was, will, will, not, will not fund energy research as much. You know, you spoke about batteries, for example. <clears throat> we, need, we need research in batteries. We need it at the very fringes of you know, the technology involved, um, this, you know, right down to the atomic level. But how to you know do things, for example, like uh, graphene, 
and make that work. Uh, and this, this is the key to an expansion, a long-term and significant expansion of renewables uh, on the grid. So uh, I'm, I'm worried about that, and I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Uh, Are I the do. federal I, government going to continue to fund research in energy? I actually think they will continue. We're going to see some cuts. But, I mean, for example, there's a great program on NOVA. I encourage you to watch it on batteries, where they look at these competing research centers in the, you know, around the United States. Looking at and it's all based in the utility sector. What kind of battery technology should they try? Some people are using the low tech, but very stable. Is more high tech. And my guess is that's so important to the future of the grid that the Congress is really not going to uh, let a lot of that to be cut back dramatically. But I wouldn't be surprised to see CCS, you know, carbon capture storage, which has become very expensive. Mm and which has become uh, uh, also a kind of battleground over, you know, foolish people who is, you know, uh, too exotic. I suspect that will get cut. But we have joint projects with both the Japanese and the Saudis on CCS. So there's some international commitments. So there's always going to be limits on how much this stuff mm -hmm. can be cut. And it cut. And in addition, members of Congress have their own hobby horses. They're so. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's take a short break. That's uh, Lou Pugliarisi of APRINC in Washington, D.C. We're talking about energy in America and how energy decision process has changed in this administration. We'll be right back. Aloha and Happy New Year. It's 2017. Please keep up with me on Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to talk about a clean and just energy future. Please join me on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock. Mahalo. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, ThinkTechHawaii.com. I appear on Mondays at 3 o'clock, and my gig is energy efficiency, doing more with less. It's the most cost-effective way that we in Hawaii are going to achieve 100% clean energy by the year 2045. I look forward to being with you. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live with Lou Pugliarisi of EPRING, an energy policy think tank in Washington, D.C., here on Energy in America. And we're talking about how national, um, how energy research process has changed in this administration. But one of the things you mentioned before we started the show, Lou, was the possibility of a carbon tax. And there has been some discussion of that. What, what's the state of discussion? So uh, a group of conservative economists, uh, thought leaders, um, proposed today in the Wall Street Journal, including George, Shaw, uh, George Schultz, former Secretary of State, mm -hmm. Secretary of Treasury, had a Bechtel, uh, Mankow, a well-known conservative economist, that the U.S. deal with carbon, deal with climate through a tax, a carbon tax, and that the $40 a ton which would be something like 25 cents a gallon, I think, something like that, maybe less. Mm -hmm. And it would be different for coal and other, other, other things. And that the funds collected from this carbon tax would be refunded to the American people quarterly. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of this is, in exchange for the carbon tax, all the environmental regulations, the mandates, the volumetric targets for CO2 control would be removed. So we'd have a pure market solution. Um, this is actually a theoretical, elegant solution. It's also politically a fantasy. It's not going to happen in Washington. There is no way the Congress is going to agree to this massive shift of money uh, unless they can get their hands on it and do something with it. You know? yeah. it, Just, it has a certain it, appeal because it simplifies the whole affair and focuses it on uh, one solution. Yeah, it, it, it allows the market, competition in the market, to uh, seek out the cheapest solution. Mm -hmm. So it, it has a lot of merits if this is your thing. Yeah. Uh, I think in the interim, we're going to see the administration take a number of specific measures on the regulatory side, which 
are not necessarily related to climate, but I believe a lot of environmentalists would argue that it would permit development, more rapid development of fossil fuels. But by the way, it would also provide more rapid development of wind energy and solar energy. The first thing they're gonna do is change the way the National Environmental Policy Act treats new projects. In the Obama administration, if I was building the LNG export facility, and it was a major federal action, because I used, I used to cross federal land with a pipeline, or I, I needed a port dredged by the Army Corps of Engineers or something, you would be required to write an environmental impact statement. But in the guidelines in the Obama administration, you would have to figure out all the upstream implications from that, like where the gas was produced to feed this facility, what happened to the dinosaurs that died, that turned into gas, you know, so you'd have to go way back. And, and I think that's going to get narrowed down. Look, they're going to say, what the administration is going to say is, you have to just look at the immediate impacts of this facility, that's it. Second, the social cost of carbon. The government has been working on a program called the Social Cost of Carbon. And that is a way for decision makers to calculate the climate effects of their projects that they're approving or not approving. Mm -hmm. And that calculation in the Obama administration had a low, what we call a low discount rate. That means a, like a low interest rate. And that means that you would get a bigger number a pre bigger number in the current period if you looked at stream of benefits and costs over time. Mm -hmm. It also measured the benefits worldwide, not just in the U.S. I'm pretty sure how the Trump administration will change that is they will use a higher discount rate and they will only allow you to take benefits in the U.S. <laughs> and then a third, I think a third that's, element... That's of, making everything smaller as, as they have done in other areas. The third element I think is going to be... Uh, either someone in the White House or someone in the administration is going to ride herd on permits. Right? Try to provide federal primacy on projects so that they are not, they be, I think they would argue uh, that the Obama administration left the door open for all these NIMBY initiatives, mm. like Sioux Indians and the Dakota Access Pipeline case. Mm. Or, endless review of the Keystone XL pipeline. I think the view from this administration is one of the reasons we have low economic growth is the regulatory state is out of control and it needs to be reined in. Mm -hmm. Those are the big changes I see in the kind of functioning of the, of the, you know, the regulatory oversight. What chance do they have a passage? Sounds like it's a pretty good chance. Those are pretty good. Now, other things like if you, want to re if you want to promote a new regulation or promulgate a new regulation, you have to remove two. Two? The, the, two for yes. one? A mathematical yes. test? That's, yes. that's cute. <laughs> and it turns out that's not so easy to do as it appears, you know, because no. I think OMB has issued, the Office of Management and Budget has issued guidance saying, well, you have to have twice, you know, if, that, if the new regulation is a billion dollars, you have to go and find uh, $2 billion worth of savings somewhere mm -hmm. else by like getting rid of older regulations. But these regulations are often embedded in law. They're not that easy to dig out of the system. Well, I mean, well, you just make it part of an executive order. You can strike all kinds of regulations and change them overnight without any, uh, without any uh, problem at all. In fact, you can ignore the Administrative Procedures Act and do it instantly. Isn't that, isn't well, that what's happening? Well, that that's what Obama did routinely. So there, there's a guy, they both do it. And, uh, but you can overdo things as this recent immigration uh, order shows. Uh, yeah. the court, we still have a court system in this country, and it's quite independent. Yes, well, we'll see what happens. That's still pending in the Ninth Circuit. You know, they had a, they had a, a hearing the other day, and uh, now we're going to hear from them, and we're going to see exactly what the federal district, uh, federal appeals court is made of. <laughs> of course, we're also going to see what the Supreme Court is made of. Um, yeah. But let me, let, me, uh, let me go back to, um, to, to the pipeline you mentioned, Keystone. Uh, he was able to reverse what was a very problematic situation for Keystone in almost not, no time at all uh, and caused the Corps of Engineers to uh, issue a so, permit in almost no... How did he no, do no, that? There are, two, there are two issues here. 
The Dakota Access Pipeline was had a core issue, a 404 permit to go under the water. And that's separate from Keystone. And that, in, in, in all fairness to energy transfer partners, they had completed the entire process when the Obama administration stepped in and said, well, the Indians are upset, the Sioux are upset, so let's sit down and talk about this a lot more. And I think the developers of that pipeline said, look, we did everything. We, we offered numerous times to engage with the Indian tribes. They refused to come. And now at the last minute, everybody wants to come and disrupt the process, right? And, you know, I think there should be some, you know, some rethinking of this. I would love everyone to see a map of the U.S. with the pipelines under it. It's just, we're just covered in pipelines. So the notion that one more pipeline is going to upset the balance is just ridiculous. Uh, now, Keystone is a separate issue. Keystone, the sort of the Obama administration kind of killed that problem project with a thousand cuts. You know, they, they stretched it out for six to seven years. And then in the end, even though the State Department said the project was relatively benign in terms of climate, they needed a win before they went to Paris to negotiate the climate agreement. Mm. Keystone has come back because people forget the Canadians pre-bought the pipe and the compressors. So the incremental cost of finishing is not, is not that high, but they still have to get permission to move it through Nebraska, and they don't have that yet. Mm -hmm. So the administration can do lots of things to speed it along, but that project's not going to be solved for a few months. Oh, and, that, and, what, and that depends on Nebraska, but Nebraska is... Nebraska, a, they, they'll either have to rewrite it or condemn. I don't know how they're going to do that, but they have to work through Nebraska. Isn't, isn't there a federal preemption on such a thing? I mean, why, is, then any yeah, state could hold it up, yeah? There is a possibility to use uh, condemned condemnation, but I think Keystone does not want to do that. Mm. The Canadians don't want to do that. Well, it's very interesting because it sounds the pendulum swings, you know. Uh, arguably, the uh, Obama administration went too far one way, and now maybe Trump is going too far the other. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. It depends on your point of view. Of course. Well, tell me, uh, how, you know, how, how you think uh, it is evolving. I mean, what, what, are the outlines clear yet about exactly what Trump is doing with energy? Um, or in, as in many other areas, do we have inconsistent messages? Um, and uh, kind of a, 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 waited, a waiting game to see how they ultimately settle down if they do uh, on all, not only the, you know, the general principles, but on the outline of what they plan to do in policy going forward. The, the first thing is the U.S. government is like the forest all. It doesn't turn on a dime. <laughs> and everybody, everybody's worried about, you know, I always say if you have to, if you have to bet between the new political masters and the bureaucrats, always bet on the bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. They'll outlast any administration. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, the ability of the new administration to turn things completely upside down overnight is actually much more limited than anyone wants to believe. So I think what the administration can do is change the emphasis. I actually don't think they will succeed in removing two regulations for every new regulation. But I do think they will create a different environment based on Trump's view that the real cost to the country is slow economic growth. And that a lot of these rules and the way our procedures work harm the capacity of the, you know, the government to grow. I mean, the, the economy to grow. And it's kind of out of his guy, Steve Bannon, who sees, you know, he has this kind of vision of the world that, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of monitored by academics and elites, and that these folks are trying to get rid of all the, all the, you know, upside risk and downside risk. And we sort of have to blow that up a bit in order to get the get the risk taking and, and higher economic growth. And I think that discussion hasn't taken place yet. Everyone is operating on an old paradigm on how to think about Trump and how to think of, how to think about the Republicans and the Democrats. And I suspect Trump isn't out of that paradigm. We haven't really figured out what it is yet, but yeah. yeah. What an exciting time we live in, or as they say in, in China, an interesting time. Yeah. Uh, but, but we'll follow it, Lou. We'll keep on following it as the outlines emerge. I really appreciate your thoughts on this, uh, all, the, all these great um, 
uh, analyses that you have. Uh, let's let's come back in two weeks and do it again. So